Today is Thursday, January 8th, 2015, and we are interviewing Richard Guthrie at the Santa Cruz Public Library in Santa Cruz, California. My name is Jeannie Zarnicki, and Jennifer Cockrell is recording. We both work for the Santa Cruz Public Libraries. This interview is being conducted for the Veterans History Project at the Library of Congress. Dick, when and where were you born? I was born at Fort Benning, Georgia. My dad was an infantry captain, and Fort Benning is even today the home of the infantry. So okay. that's where I was. And what year was that? It was 1940, May of 1940. Okay. And my dad had been there for uh, probably three years. We left shortly after that. I don't remember much about Fort Benning until I went back there as a second lieutenant to take uh, officer basic course. Oh, okay. And um, what, was, what was your branch of service in the war that you served in? I was an infantryman. Okay. And that was in uh, Vietnam that you served? In Vietnam in 1967-68. Uh, uh, I was with the 1st Battalion Mechanized 50th Infantry, which went over by ship in uh, September of, of 1967. Okay. And what was your highest rank? The highest rank I reached in uh, 34 years in uniform, I got to the rank of Colonel. Okay. All right. And so let's, let's start off by having you tell us a little bit about your family background and, and what you were doing before you joined the military. Uh, I was raised in as, an, as an army brat, and so we moved around a lot. I never lived in one house for more than two years. We lived in my youth. Uh, uh, we lived in Germany in 1946, just after the war. I was on the first boatload of dependents to go to Germany after the war and join my dad, who'd been there for some years. Uh, in fact, I didn't remember him before that. So I was six, I spent a couple of years in Germany then. We lived in France for a couple of years after that in the, uh, in the late 50s. We lived in France for two years. I went to a French boarding school and then came back to the States to a, another boarding school. Uh, and so by the time I was in high school, I had firmly decided I wanted no part of the Army. It was too much moving around. And, uh, but I had a little academic problem in high school and, and uh, wound up without a uh, college acceptance and decided since the draft was coming anyway in the, in the late 50s, I would enlist and get the draft out of the way. Then I'd go to college and learn how to make lots of money. And so uh, I enlisted, after two years enlisted, uh, I had done a, something of a turnaround and, and uh, decided uh, I was called a service, and, and I wanted to, to serve something higher than myself. And so I tried, tried for West Point and got into West Point and was commissioned in 63 as a, as a second lieutenant of infantry. And went on to serve uh, in, in lots of different places. We had nine years in Europe, <coughs> four different countries. I served two years in Panama, a year in Vietnam, a year in Korea. Uh, and then the, the last time I was in Europe, I was in France for two years, the Netherlands for one year, Belgium for two years, and my final tour in Europe in 87 was as the uh, chief of Allied Staff Berlin, still occupied city. And my staff was one-third American, one-third French, and one-third British. Wow. Fascinating job. Yeah. And then I came back and, and uh, I retired from the Army in 1991. Went to work in Peru in a copper mine for five and a half years. Mm -hmm. okay. And came, to, uh, came back to, uh, came to California. I had not lived here, except as a, uh, my dad was stationed at Camp Roberts once for uh, maybe six months. I went to school in Paso Robles. Mm -hmm. okay. And what, what type, type of training, military training did you have? The, the uh, yeah, basic training or mm -hmm. special training? And, and where? I did, I, did uh, I enlisted uh, two weeks after my 17th birthday. I had to have permission, to, my parents' permission to, to uh, let me do that. And I went to basic training at Fort Meade, Maryland with a unit that used to do what they called gyroscope. The second armored cav would trade places with the third armored cav every two years in Germany. 
And so I joined the 2nd Armored Cav just before it gyroscoped to Germany. And we went to Bamberg, Germany, and I served there in the, uh, in the 2nd Cav as, as part of the border watch in those days, guarding against the Soviet hordes that were threatening to come down our throats any minute. Mm -hmm. And what type of training did you need for that, for that position? Well, uh, at that time I was in an artillery battery, a self-propelled artillery battery, and I was the battery computer. I was the, uh, didn't have computers back then, I was it. And I had a slide rule and uh, some graphical tables, and I would apply the uh, data to the commands that I then would call to the, the uh, six howitzers in the battery. And that was my job, keep that straight. I had two chart operators also working up deflection and elevation data for me. Wow. And did you have to train with any sort of artillery at all? Or? Oh, yeah. Okay. Oh, yes. Okay. And in fact, our battery won the uh, Seventh Army annual, uh, annual training test score. We had the highest score of anybody in Europe that, that year I was there. Okay. So we did lots and lots of field training in Germany. Okay. And how was it adapting to that sort of lifestyle? It was great. I loved it. Yeah? Yeah. I was, I, I, I think probably having been raised in a military family, I think there was a lot that wasn't, wasn't particularly surprising to me. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, I found that uh, even though I had previously said I didn't want any part of it, I loved it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And what about the physical regimen? Was it? It was great. Pretty intense. It was good. Uh huh. Yeah. Okay. And the good. food? How was the food? Fine. Good it's fine. Food too. Yeah. That's great. Okay. And um, did you have any uh, special training before you uh, went to Vietnam? Uh, well, following commissioning and, and following the infantry officer basic course at Fort Benning, I also took uh, airborne and, and uh, ranger school. And after I had spent a year in Colorado as, a, as an infantry lieutenant and uh, both a platoon leader and a company commander, uh, I was sent to Special Forces at Fort Bragg, so I also had a six-month Special Forces officer course. So I, I, was, I was about as well trained as, as a, a captain of infantry could be. There weren't too many courses I hadn't taken. Okay. And uh, what, what was your, your first mission in Vietnam? In Vietnam, our first combat mission, I'll read you an excerpt of in a little while and, okay. and give you some of it. Okay. I'll give you some of that so, adventure. So the, the readings that you're going to do for us have specifics about what, what you did during your service. They do. Okay. Um, I can tell you a little bit about that now sure. if you're interested. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, when I came back from uh, commanding a company in Vietnam, I, I uh, of course, was uh, I wanted to pay tribute to the soldiers, and that was especially so because of the way they were welcomed home by uh, the American public at the time. I, I uh, went through the rest of my time in the Army. Uh, I was in the green machine, and I was shielded from a lot of that, but I, we, we certainly felt it and knew about it. And so uh, in, when I retired a second time from uh, Southern Peru Copper Corporation, I decided I wanted to write the story and pay tribute to the soldiers who had served so well. Um, so the, the memoir talks about events in 1967-68 with B Company, uh, but it also uh, stays with us. Here, I'll show you a picture. This is uh, me as a company commander in 1967 on the shore of the South China Sea. In 1998, I went back there with two people who were in the company, the, f the first platoon leader and the senior company medic. And so this is, these are actually taken close together, but when I was there this time, I didn't have this picture, so I couldn't line up the skyline so they were exactly the same. But this, the, uh, the memoir I've written uh, covers an event in 1967, and then 
uh, at the end of each chapter is a more contemporaneous uh, portion that may show three of us revisiting the same battlefield in uh, Bindin province. Mm -hmm. and, and, uh, or it may be uh, a, a group of us gathering at a reunion at Fort Benning, Georgia. We go there every two years yeah, okay. and do that. Mm -hmm. And so I, the, uh, the memoir stays with many of the same players up to the present day. So I've just actually, I've recently put in some things that some conversations I just had with people have gone into the draft of the memoir. Okay. So it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a long range sort of a book, mm -hmm. covers 40 years at least. Okay. Well, that's great. When you, when you were there, were you able to stay in touch with your family and friends? Sure. Were you? Sure, yeah. yeah. Letter. Didn't even have to put a stamp on it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Took about two weeks to get there. Any two, any, two and a half, three weeks. Any phone calls? No, 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 no. Okay. No, no my, my wife actually, um, Cynthia bought a, a, a little tape recorder. A little tape recorder in those days was about twice the size of this. <laughs> and, and had reels about that big. And the first one she sent me was a recording of our, our unborn, our first child's heartbeat. Nice. Wow. That's special. That's great. So, so yes, we could communicate, but it, was, it, wasn't, uh, it wasn't instantaneous. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you, <clears throat> you were awarded many medals, uh, Silver Star, Bronze Star, Air medals, combat infantrymen badge, Vietnamese uh, cross of gallantry. That, wow, that's pretty impressive. Yeah, well, a lot of those don't come from doing anything smart. No. Mm. They, they weren't for specific. Oh yeah, no, they were for specific things. That's what I but it was some, sometimes it was it was doing dangerous things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do, do, do you want to talk about any of those close missions, or is that already... Uh, I'll, I'll read about some of that, okay. some of that okay. I'll read about. And, um, and you did become a, a, langu a language instructor at some point in your life as well. Was that before or after Vietnam, the language instructor? Well, I, yeah, and that's, uh, none of them are short stories, I guess. <laughs> uh, when I got to West Point, they had a screening for advanced languages, and I went and took the screening for advanced French because I'd been to a French boarding school and did pretty well in French. Um, and the, the colonel who interviewed me uh, said, forget it, you, you're, you already speak too much French, we're not gonna sign you up for that. Um, two things happened. One was he said, he said, I see you have a year of high school Spanish, so you go take the interview for advanced Spanish and we'll see what happens. I came out of there and a buddy of mine was, was uh, waiting to be interviewed also for French. He also had gone to, he was, we were buddies because we both had similar backgrounds. And I said, I said um, he wouldn't let me take French. Uh, he went in and forgot lots of his French, and he took advanced <laughs> he took advanced French and coasted. I took advanced Spanish, and and I had a couple of native Spanish speakers in there with me, and so it was much tougher competition. But I'm glad I did it because because uh -huh. I still do fine in Spanish too. Yeah. So teaching teaching uh, language at West Point was a delight. The cadets are wonderful people, and and. Uh, I thoroughly enjoyed my time there with the cadets. Uh, they keep you on your toes. They don't. They don't. Uh, they don't put up with a lot of fluff. They, mm -hmm. they want. Mm -hmm. They want the real thing. But I had a great time with them. That's good. Well, I think we should go ahead and have you do some of your readings at this point. Okay. Yes. So I've mentioned that that. Uh, I went back to Vietnam with the, first of all, the, the original purpose of this memoir was to, was to pay tribute to those soldiers. The trip back in 98 to Vietnam was specifically done so I could refresh my memory, go visit the same places and, and be sure I could describe them in a, in a meaningful way, a telling way. Uh, this first 
this first uh, episode I'll read to you is the first mission that our company was sent out to perform. We were, uh, it was late one afternoon, it was raining, and we had just moved from one fire base to another fire base. We were in total chaos, and the colonel called me up and said, well, if this weather lifts, we're going to fly you out to reinforce a different battalion. We were a mechanized unit used to mostly traveling and operating in our armored personnel carriers. 20 armored personnel carriers hauled us around. But in this case, we'd go on foot and we'd, we'd be flown in, not in a combat assault, not on a landing zone that was someplace out in the woods, but on one that that battalion was already securing. It turned out we, we would pack up and go in about 20 minutes notice, so it was very chaotic. And it was 5, five or 5.30 in the afternoon when we sat down on a rice paddy in, in the, on the fringe of where this guy's battalion was in a very big fight. And the mission he gave me was to move my company uh, south and around behind where the enemy force was up a hill in a huge rock pile, boulders the size of these tables, they're the size of Volkswagens, enormous boulders going up a hill, which the, uh, his, one of his companies had stumbled on some, a couple of stray shots that morning and had sent someone up to check on it. And they got a ways up in the rock pile and had took a couple of casualties and it turned out there was a regiment up there. And of course the people in the high ground and who know the terrain, who know how to get around have a great advantage. So he had brought his whole battalion in there, 700 men, um, and, and uh, it was now getting dark and his main concern was that the, the uh, North Vietnamese that were up in that rock pile would go out the back side of the hill and escape. So he sent me around that hill. So, uh, so we're moving uh, in that direction. That's what this reading is about. And, uh, you'll hear part of what went on. <clears throat> At Fort Hood, we had concentrated on fast-paced, mechanized operations. I felt we'd gotten it working well, but that evening in the 506 Valley, it took us far longer than I expected. Among other things, the weapons platoon was having trouble carrying the 10 mortar rounds we'd brought. Were they paralyzed by the fear we all felt? Impatiently, I told Lieutenant Wanzik to transfer some of the shells to the second and third platoons. Under no circumstances would we leave behind any ammo for the Viet Cong. At last, the platoon leaders reported they were ready to move. While the men lined up in, in the formation I had prescribed, I ritualistically patted my pockets and pouches to be sure I had my ammo, my map, my compass, my little book with radio call signs and frequencies. Nervously, I flicked the selector switch for my M16 from safe to semi-automatic and back again. Turning to first platoon leader Brian Thomas, I whispered, move out, and B Company set off walking south. I radioed to the operations officer that we were on the move and then slipped my command group into 1st Platoon's open column just in front of the trailing rifle squad. In the fading light, I saw the others falling in behind us. Our paddy strength this night was about 110 men. We'd left a handful of soldiers back at the fire base to secure gear and maintain the vehicles. And of course, there were cooks, mechanics, and clerks who didn't habitually get to the field. Colonel Love told me he estimated a North Vietnamese Army regiment was in the rock pile. Those were about 700 strong, so if we met such a unit, we'd be severely outnumbered. I made a mental note to discuss our field strength with the first sergeant at my earliest opportunity. Night operations weren't new for any of us, but this was the first time we walked across country with live ammunition locked and loaded. Our pucker factor ran plenty high. I could see in the fading light that the troops around me were applying the basic rules. Maintain distance between men. Keep weapons at the ready. Move quietly. These are simple enough, but they'll go unheeded if leadership is lax or when the troops are untrained or undisciplined or just tired. Our azimuth took us across fields that had been planted but not harvested. The rice had gone to seed on stalks now nearly two feet high. 
By the time we covered half a, no, half a mile, night had fallen and the firefights, terrifying flare-ups, pretty much faded behind us. Now the rhythmic swish, swish of boots plowing through rice stalks superseded the clatter of shooting. Occasionally a man stumbled on an unseen rock or stepped in a hole, and the muffled thump might be followed by a whispered, fuck. Sporadically, the shh of rain on the leaves covered the faint rattling of a man's rifle against his web gear or an ammo belt's rhythmic clacking on a machine gun stock. Very little of the light from the moon or stars got through the overcast, but sporadically, the low clouds flickered as if lit by lightning. Just after those flashes, we would hear the carack of artillery, high explosive thundering at random locations on the wooded hillside to our right. Now and then an illumination round would pop close by and we would freeze like jackrabbits in the surreal blue-white light and wait for the flare to oscillate to earth under its little parachute. The wobbly torch revealed surrounding countryside in monochromatic hues. Trees and bushes, rice fields, soldiers, weapons, all came out in some shade of gray. I was gratified to see the troops avert their eyes from the source of the brilliance, and I hope they were also remembering to close one eye to preserve their night vision. With each flare, we held in place until it burned itself out beneath the corkscrew of smoke it left above in the dark sky. Most of the hooches and outbuildings we passed were still standing, but many sagged and drooped as if they'd been abandoned for quite some time. Occasionally, I spotted a shovel or a hoe leaning against a shed or the odd plow or work table. All are eerie indicators that farmers from that place had departed in a hurry. The occasional flare light revealed hedgerows and paddy dikes. My head swiveled constantly and I peered to see irregularities or signs of the enemy we just knew was crouched in there eager and ready to take us down. As the steep hills defining the valley came together, our route took us through the jaws of one ideal ambush site after another. The old timers called the 506 the Valley of the Shadow of Death. And right then I understood why. Even in daylight, this would be an undesirable place to operate. We stopped often while the leading platoon checked threatening or suspicious areas. Tension focused my mind as never before and I strained all five senses for warnings. In vain, I peered for an enemy in each huddled shape and shadow. I inhaled every strange smell, cocked my ear to each new sound. Scared for our lives, we were intensely alert. This was, I realized, a classic primordial hunt, and there was something euphoric, something thrilling in the intensity, the concentration, and the fear. We were alive. Did this kill or be killed hunt represent some fulfillment of our manly, soldierly destiny? Inevitably, our cross-country course intersected Route 506, the one dirt road slake, snaking along the valley floor. Pressed to get to our destination, I put us on that road despite the increased danger. The mission had, come, had to come before safety. Nervously, I put us on the road despite, uh, sorry, Nervously, we tiptoed along the rutted track for half an hour. Then, first platoon again stopped to check a suspicious trail coming up from the stream bed to the right. Our column accordioned together in some disarray. And then quickly, the troops adjusted. In seconds, they took up a herringbone formation, facing alternately left and right, each man on one knee and set to defend against a threat from the thickets lining either side of the ox cart track. Again, I felt proud of the way the soldiers adapted to the changing circumstances. After five minutes kneeling in the light rain, I stood impatiently and walked forward to find Brian behind his lead squad. I whispered to him that unless there was good reason not to, we really needed to press on. He whispered, move out, to his first squad leader, and the men stood. Just at that instant, my peripheral vision caught movement to our right, and I froze. Scanning frantically, I could just discern three shapes tiptoeing towards us. Arms outstretched, each one held a sheet of clear plastic over his head. As they cut diagonally through our column, I realized they had no clue we were there. In an instant, I caught the strong scent of musky wood, exactly what the instructors at Ankei had described. 
The intruders were upwind, so the smell advantage was ours. The lead enemy soldier was no more than five feet from him when Brian yelled, Halt! Of course, they didn't halt. They bolted. They were all the way through our column before Brian yelled again, Halt! And then, Fire! After a bewildered pause, the night air cracked with a first scattering of shots that quickly grew to a rock slide roar as the first platoon loosed a salvo in the direction of the fleeing figures. Within seconds, an M60 machine gun blasted into action, dazzling me with bright muzzle flashes and adding its throatier uproar to the din of rifle fire. My own M16 jammed after one shot, and in a frenzy, I tugged a grenade from my harness and fumbled to pull the pin before hurling it at the bushes that had swallowed the enemy soldiers. I was shouting, fire in the hole, for the third time when the grenade's silver-white flash blinded us all. And you can, uh, I'm still here, and you can read how this comes out when the book is, is published. Okay. <clears throat> so you've just heard about an air mobile operation. Uh, and as I said, we also mounted on our armored personnel carriers. And this, is, this, this event uh, occurred during uh, perhaps our first mechanized operation as a company. And typically, we operated as companies, independent companies, were away from the fire base. We left landing zone uplift and headed north on Route 1 for a short distance, and then we turned east towards the South China Sea on, on Route 505. Occasionally, the road was straight enough for me to see all of first platoon, but usually curves and trees and hedgerows hid the lead vehicles from my view. Then came a radio call. 616, check out the sign on the next building to your right over. 30 seconds later, I came to what he was talking about, a neatly scripted admonition painted on the whitewashed wall. It read, do not drive tanks on the people's rice fields. While I felt a deep pang of sympathy for the poor bastard who'd painted that plea, damn it, I had American soldiers to protect and a mission to accomplish. There wasn't any doubt that once we drove on it, the enemy soon would be seeding this very road with mines that could kill. Next time we took Route 505, we'd have no choice but to drive on the people's rice fields. Within a few minutes, our column stopped rolling again. Six, this is one six. We've got a file of little people leathernecks on foot crossing the road. They're headed north. I was about to fire them up, but luckily saw the advisors over. By calling them little people leathernecks, Brian was trying to mask the identity of friendly troops over the radio. Of course, a skilled enemy could break this simple code. The news infuriated me. I had been given no warning about friendlies operating anywhere around our planned route. Calling battalion to lodge my complaint, I was told that the American advisor with the South Vietnamese Marines had apparently forgotten to request clearance for his unit's passage through our assigned area. His sloppy violation of procedures unnerved me. Lapses like this could lead to ugly and fatal incidents. My instructions were to hold in place until the Marines cleared the intersection. I had to have Hayes pull my APC armored personnel carrier forward so I could watch the open columns trudging across our route. Among the several hundred soldiers f filing past, an alarming number carried live chickens or small pigs they must have purloined on their way through. Disgusted, I wondered what else these allies of ours might have liberated from their compatriots. Heavily armed as they combed the countryside on their so-called pacification mission, they had unlimited opportunity for high and low crimes. I had heard that corruption in their armed forces often left South Vietnamese soldiers near starvation. This would explain their motivation, but surely, I thought, the villagers who just lost their precious livestock to these Marines would have a hard time warming up to the government they represented. The idling engines of our stationary vehicles throbbed, filling the air with that diesel stink. Within five minutes, clusters of villagers, mainly kids, had gathered to study us. Our men, scarcely more than kids themselves, dug into their rucksack for goodies, the sea ration, chocolate, or chewing gum, or cans of fruit they'd stash for just such an opportunity. Soon, thin hockey pucks of tinfoil-wrapped chocolate 
and olive drab cans of fruit cocktail sailed from atop personnel carriers. The riflemen from 1st platoon aimed for smaller tykes on the fringes of the clusters of shouting kids. Those targeted for the prize would strain and jump but then get slammed to the ground as older, bigger ones elbowed in to make off with their goody. Our troops, outraged by the injustice, would try again to reach the underdogs with the same results, nearly every time. The ironic symbolism of the scene gave me a chill. There simply was no way that our men could succeed in imposing a new, fairer order on those children. This hamlet seemed typical of what we'd seen so far. Lining the narrow dirt road on either side were faded brown houses and outbuildings made of materials gathered locally. The roofs were thatched with two-foot depth of palm frond and sloped steeply enough to carry off monsoon rains. The walls of the buildings were thin screens made of woven palm leaves. Running the width of almost every house was a thigh-high stoop, maybe three feet deep. I imagined that during the rainy season this afforded workspace with both shelter and dry footing. From what I could see, all of a family's vital functions, cooking, feeding, sleeping, recreation, procreation, birthing, and all the rest played out in one or two dim, low rooms. The column of Vietnamese Marines continued to trudge by, and I couldn't yet see the end of them. It looked as if we'd be waiting a while. Telling Hayes to shut down the engine, I took off my helmet to mop the sweat. Then I radioed the platoon leaders to send out dismounted security. Within a minute, a soldier clambered down from each track and cautiously moved 20 or so yards off the road. The man on security was expected to tape up, take up an alert kneeling position with rifle at the ready and scan for signs of threat in the bushes, hedges, paddy dikes, and hooches to his front. This was the procedure. But some of the dismounted troops quickly got sucked into refereeing the equitable distribution of the handouts. It goes without saying that a soldier passing out candy to a clamoring throng of children is providing anything but good surveillance. At the same time, knowing what a treat it was for them to bring a smile to a kid's face, I tried to sound compassionate when I told the platoon leaders to tighten their security. From somewhere, an old woman appeared. Tiny and stooped, I guessed that she couldn't weigh more than 90 pounds, even counting the large cast iron hoe she toted on one bony shoulder. Years of hard work in the tropical sun had left her face and hands as wrinkled and dark as old shoe leather. Apparently she had figured out which armored box boasted the most radio antennas, so to lodge her complaint with the guy in charge, she marched up to mine. Tears streamed down her cheeks as she shouted up at me, shaking her fist. I had no idea what she was hollering, but it was clear this feisty little granny wanted us gone from her hamlet, from her district, from her country. As she railed, her grimace exposed intermittent rows of, e of teeth, each one blackened by the betel nut. Apparently, all the older Vietnamese in the countryside chewed it, and I wondered if the nut's narcotic effect could contribute to her agitated state. The scene was comical in a way, but mostly I was struck by the pathos. In response to her harangue, I nodded and tried to look friendly. This only enraged her more. Finally planting her feet, she swung with all her might and bashed the side of my APC with her hoe. The impact seemed gratifying to her, and soon she worked herself into a state of fury, clanging the hoe repeatedly against the armor plating. Eventually, a boy of maybe six or seven came up and gently took her by an arm. Her loud tirade went on, even as the boy tenderly led her away. Uh, as I mentioned, we made a return trip in 1998, and, and uh, we had innumerable opportunities to rethink the process and uh, to, to work through some of the three decades. Uh, that was, 98 was 30 years exactly after we'd been, we'd been there the first time. So we had these three decade old feelings and, and uh, emotions that sometimes would spill out of our psychic duffel bags that I expect most combat veterans are also lugging. This is a vignette that, that happened early in our 1998 time in Binden province. Uh, let me just add here that uh, to travel there, Vietnam is still a communist country and very tightly controlled, so 
for us to, to get permission to go where we wanted to go, we had to hire a guide, a government guide, uh, who was also a very staunch uh, 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 <laughs> propagandist. <laughs> he, he, would, he, would, he would point out everything that Uncle Ho had done to make things better. Uh, at any rate, uh, it, was, it was transportation and it was somebody, he could speak a, f a little English, not, not a lot. We stopped for lunch a couple of miles south of Landing Zone Ichiban and close by the old northern entrance to Landing Zone Uplift. At a rustic lean-to of a restaurant, the three of us sat at one shaded table while Mr. Noy and Mr. Kwong, the driver, disappeared to another section. The waitress brought egg rolls and a plate of salad that looked like watercress but tasted mild and sweet. Brian got up and went to find Noy to ask him what was in the egg rolls. He rejoined our table, declaring he wouldn't be eating that stuff. I asked him what it was he didn't want to eat, but he couldn't say. Noy's answer had apparently been ambiguous, but Brian wasn't taking any chances. Toby and I chortled and divided his plate between us and smacked it down. Soon the waitress took great care serving up the entree. Atop a rice ball in each of the three plates, she carefully balanced a tidy coil of meat, maybe a foot long. Was it an eel? Talking to us softly in a language we couldn't fathom, she artfully ladled a grayish gravy over the hole and garnished each plate with more of those greens. Brian watched the tender care with which she served us and then paled and looked up to ask her for another bottle of water. Toby and I raved about the glorious variety of flavors and textures. Brian looked away while we smacked it all down. After lunch, we headed across the restaurant's unpaved parking lot for our van. Brian peeled the wrapper from a power bar and muttered about the food. Apparently, he was still upset about the inconclusive answers our guide gave him about the ingredients of the egg rolls. Feeling mischievous, I said, Yeah, you know, it tasted a little like the dog meat I ate in Colombia one time. Since dog meat is a regular source of protein for the Vietnamese, Brian didn't appreciate my humor. Just then a car pulled in from Highway 1 and the driver jumped out to start an animated conversation with our guide. The well-dressed man was, Mr. Noy translated, a judge from the high court at Fumi District. Jabbering energetically, the man came towards us and shook our hands warmly. Then he turned to show us his profile and pointed to scars on his, on his, uh, alongside one eye and under his chin. Then he pointed at us. He got these scars, Noy said, as a 15-year-old Viet Cong soldier. Then the man nodded his head towards a nearby hill mass. The wounds came from a fight with the Americans up there, he said. I was certain that B Company had scoured that hill more than once, and at least once we had been in a firefight there. Astonished, I cried out, hey, guys, he might have gotten those scars in a scrap with us. Finding myself face to face with a former enemy soldier at first unhinged me. In an instant, I saw again that many of our men who'd been maimed or killed by all the Viet Cong booby traps. Part of me wanted to hate this man, maybe even kick his ass. Turning to the guide, I said, tell him what I said. The judge nodded, smiled, and shook our hands again. We should be glad all that is finished, he said. Then he told Noy to be sure to contact him if we ran into any trouble getting permission to visit the places we had come to see. My emotions flipped. Now I felt a compelling urge to drop everything and just go off with the man. I could imagine us installing ourselves someplace in the shade where over a cold beer or two we might while away a whole day just trading stories. During the quarter mile drive to what had been landing zone uplift, the three of us fell silent. The judge's warm-heartedness towards us had been genuine, and he was right. The war had been over for more than three decades. Certainly keeping alive old animosities would accomplish nothing. I wondered why I, along with the rest of our countrymen, hadn't figured this out years before. So that's the end of that. Uh, we'll go back to 1967 now. And this is, a, this is a little episode that I call Downs. 
It's named after my radio operator. <clears throat> Half an hour later, we made an air assault to a village at the southern edge of the Dam Trow Lake. We got our cordon in quickly without incident and established my command post on the edge of the hamlet in a clearing the size of a large living room rug. The Chinook bringing the Vietnamese National Police Field Force platoon flew in and their troops deployed. Soon they had assembled two dozen villagers in a holding area, a taro patch, in a holding area in a taro patch, a stone's throw from my command post. The police had just begun their search when a radio call sign I didn't recognize asked me to secure and mark a one-ship landing zone for my inbound visitors. I hadn't been told about any visitors, but after all, the call could only have come from one of our helicopters, so I pointed at a harvested rice paddy nearby and told radio operator Tom Downs to pop a smoke grenade there on the stubble. Soon, a shiny VIP-type Huey touched down and outclambered six or seven field-grade officers from the 1st Cavalry Division staff. These majors and lieutenant colonels were impeccably dressed in starched jungle fatigues and spit-shined boots. The Huey took off, and they clustered in a tight huddle, looking around nervously as if fully expecting any minute a barrage of enemy fires to erupt from the hedgerows. Then a major made a beeline for one of the machine gun positions on our cordon. When he hunkered down to check chat with the gun's crew, I imagined the chaos if all the others fanned out as well to wander around my perimeter. Desperate to limit the distractions, I invited the visitors to gather around me in my command post, and then I launched into an impromptu briefing on what the company was about. I was still describing our cordon when another unknown station called and asked for smoke on a secured landing zone. In came another Huey bearing another load, and I soon found my little command post cluttered with at least a dozen spiffy division staff officers. A garrulous, overweight guy from logistics peppered me with questions about rations, while a beady-eyed intelligence major pumped me for information on just where I thought the 5th North Vietnamese Army Division had gotten to. Several others ambled over to corner my radio operators. Of course, the troops, awed by all the rank, were too polite to insist on being left alone so they could devote their full attention to the radio. My job was taking care of Company B, not hosting visitors, and I soon resented this intrusion. But I didn't know how to encourage them to leave. Gripped by an intense rage to somehow get this crew of RIMFs, that's an acronym, an indelicate acronym, acronym about the rear echelon people, uh, to get the RIMFs out of there, I decided I'd call the S3 back at uplift. When I looked around for my radio operators, who were supposed to be no more than a few feet from me at all times, I discovered the brass had crowded them over to the far side of the clearing. Frustrated and cranky, I barked, Downs! In a flash, before my eyes, in perfect unison, the field grade officers plunged face down into the dirt. When the villagers in the holding area witnessed that, they too hit the deck. At this point, radio handset and his outstretched hand, PFC Tom Downs, picked his way around the prostrated forms and hustled towards me. On his face, I spotted the grin he was trying to suppress. It got me laughing so hard I nearly fell off the paddy dike. Composing myself, I made my call to battalion. And shortly after that, the muddied visitors must have figured out it was time to move on and they left the way they'd come. We never again got any surprise visitors from Division and B Company. I always suspected that first group of staff queens passed the word around headquarters, don't visit B first of the 50th, the wise-ass captain makes fun of visitors. So that was that one. Uh, this next one talks about an air assault operation up high on a hill. Uh, called the Kaijep Mountain. Uh, we were landed up there with the mission of searching a steep gully for some kind of enemy installation. We didn't have any in other information about our target. It was a tiny landing zone, scarcely big enough to accommodate a single helicopter. As an aside, Landing one helicopter at a time is obviously time-consuming, but it's also dangerous. If there's enemy waiting for you down there, the first troops to arrive are easily outnumbered before reinforcements can be inserted. 
On that day, we had a green landing zone. No enemy was there waiting for us. As soon as we had consolidated on the landing zone, I had our mortar platoon leader set up to fire in our support and guard the men's rucksacks. And then I took the rest of the company, about 80 men on foot, to move to the designated gully and search it. And here's the way it went. On the Appalachian Trail, this might have been a pleasant, mildly challenging 45-minute hike, but this was what we called Indian country. Ahead of us, we had anything but a leisurely walk in the sun. Stretching 100 yards along the narrow trail, the company walked stealthily in single file with four or five paces between men. Up in the lead, the first platoon had a point man 10 or 15 yards to the front. To secure against surprises from either side, all three platoons had scouts out the same distance on either flank. The going was especially tough for flankers. Even as they struggled to keep up with the main body on the trail, they had to move noiselessly as possible through the dense low scrub. I was tense for a, for a fight and strained with everything in me to detect the killer I was certain was there, lurking behind every shadowy bush, rock, and tree trunk. I knew each step would put me squarely in the sweet spot of his AK-47 sights. One squeeze of the trigger and he would drop me in a hail of lead. Up ahead in the column, I could see heads jerking as eyes darted nervously from side to side, squinting in the uncovered ridge line's bright sunlight. Each of us intently scanned the shadows for any irregularity, footprint, trace of a shooter, or the taut length of nylon monofilament that would trigger a booby trap. As each cautious step took me past my last chosen refuge, I hunted frantically for a new rock stump or depression I would dive behind when the expected bedlam ripped asunder the morning calm. This movement to contact in enemy territory was horrifying and yet years later I would admit to myself that there was also something exhilarating about being on the hunt this way. With all five senses working overtime I was alive, more alert, more switched on than I had ever felt. We'd been underway for half an hour when I raised my arm to signal a halt. Time to give the troops a few minutes to readjust equipment, take a drink, and listen for sounds of the enemy. Our file stopped without much accordion effect, and the men dropped to one knee to face outward in a herringbone. Medic Toby Milroy stayed on his feet and quietly worked the line, pausing at each man to hand out a salt tablet or pantomime encouragement to drink water. Along the file, a leader or two leaned in to whisper terse instructions in the ear of a subordinate. After a few minutes, I stood and ended the break with an upward wave of my arm at the platoon leaders. As all stood to move again, I overheard Private Lloyd Snow discreetly coaching a man who'd been assigned and fused into the company just the day before. Now, Jonesy, whenever you get up from a halt, Snow whispered, you actually feel around you with your hand. Make sure you don't leave nothing behind. He demonstrated in exaggerated motions, patting the dry grasses around his feet. See? See what I'm doing? Snow whispered. Get in the habit of checking like this. He patted full circle around, his, around the ground, around his feet. Even in daylight, so you'll do it automatically in the dark. Now you do it. Snow leaned in to watch the newcomer check around his feet, and his head bobbed enthusiastic approval. Everything we carry is important, Snow went on. We all depend on each other to have the right things. You leave a grenade or a claymore behind, and Snow shook his head sadly. We're sure to need it that night. He grabbed the newcomer's arm for emphasis, and what's worse, they'll find them and use them on us later, so you always check. He then gave the man a reassuring pat on the shoulder and jerked his head in the direction of March to get him moving with the others. Lloyd Snow wasn't a squad leader or even a fire team leader. I doubted he was a high school graduate. B Company was lucky to have him and all the others like him. Where the ridge line angled due west, I figured we were just uphill from our assigned objective. Stopping again, I faced the entire file left and waved the 90-odd 90, 90 men off the trail and down into the dense vegetation. The hillside was so steep we stumbled and skidded, making it impossible to stay on line. Once we left the crest behind, the terrain masked the last traces of cooling sea breeze. 
and exposed us to the merciless hammering of midday sun. Sweat poured and it was now slow going. In the dense bushes, our load-bearing harnesses, the pouches, and even our weapons all seemed cleverly designed to snag on a wait-a-minute vine about every third step. By high noon, we were several hundred meters down from the ridge trail. The trees were taller and ground cover thinned out. Now and then through a gap in the trees, I could catch a glimpse of the varied greens of the paddy squares carpeting the floor of the crescent far below. Moving warily down the slope, we occasionally passed a neat stack of firewood apparently left by woodcutters who came through some weeks or months before us. Reaching our assigned gully, we continued downward, combing both sides. But we found no indicators of recent military presence. Around one o'clock, I stopped us again and let the men drink water and nibble some sea rations. After 20 minutes, I assigned each platoon leader a sector and told them to continue searching. After an hour with no reports of enemy presence, I was about to declare our search to be over. It was just then that Darrell Sarawine radioed that one of his soldiers had found a tunnel entrance. Kicking footholds in the side of the slope, I contoured over until I found him, pointing at an opening smaller than a basketball. An animal digging such a hole would have left the spoil where it landed, but here there was no pile of loose dirt. Someone must have concealed or dispersed it. Yet I doubted even a small man could get through this opening. What purpose could it serve? In our training at Anke, we'd been taught that larger tunnel complexes need ventilation systems. So this might be an air intake of some kind. Unfortunately, the training didn't cover what to do about air intakes. My mind conjured up a whole North Vietnamese Army regiment a few yards beneath our feet. I'd been told that in the near future, we'd be getting allocations to send a couple of volunteers to the tunnel rat school, but we needed one now. While I stood at this hole wondering what to do next, I heard a man thrashing through the brush behind me. Sir, sir, I hear you need someone to go down a hole. I'm ready, Cam. He came alongside me and then hunkered down to examine the opening. Nicknamed Audie Murphy after the World War II infantry, hero, this short, wiry, two-fisted Irishman from Scranton, Pennsylvania had only joined B Company after we arrived in Vietnam. He hadn't been with us for the intensive training at Fort Hood, and he'd missed the shipboard bonding as well. Nonetheless, Private First Class James John Murphy had wasted no time establishing himself as the man who in tough situations came up with the irreverent wisecrack that coaxed a laugh and alleviated the tensions we all felt. Every unit needs such a soldier. I wasn't surprised that he was the first to volunteer for a mission that nobody rational wanted to take on. I was plenty grateful that even without specialized training, Murphy appointed himself Company B's own tunnel rat. When we find the people entrance, Murphy, I'll send you in, I said. As an afterthought, I told him to stay within calling distance. Roger that, sir, I'll be standing by and Captain. I put fresh batteries in my flashlight just this morning. James John Murphy was going to live forever. So in that, uh, in that last episode, that 1967 episode, we met Toby Milroy. Toby Milroy was the senior company medic and uh, came back came back with me and Brian Thomas when we went in 1998. So at the end of the chapter that you've just heard a reading from is, is a uh, conversation that I had with Toby Milroy uh, during the 98 return visit. Half an hour later, the van slowed as we reached the outskirts of Quinyan City. Toby woke up from his nap with a start and glanced around, apparently reminded of something he blurted. You know, Dick, I saw Murphy at the 82nd evac. I came down to Quinyon to visit him and a couple of others who were still there. He was still alive, but he'd never regained consciousness. I just sat next to his cot and held his hand and talked to him a little, told him how things was going in B Company. Then I asked the ward nurse about him and she said they were concerned. They couldn't stabilize him for the trip to Japan. 
His voice trailed off, then he swallowed and continued his story. I went to a different ward to find a couple of the others from B Company and eat lunch. Later I came back to see if Murphy had come around at least a little, he said. As soon as I walked in, the nurse turned away. She wouldn't even look at me. No shit, Toby, I said. Of course, you can imagine how that made me feel. I went over to Murphy's place. The only thing there was an empty rack, fresh sheets on it. All his gear was gone, and so was he. The nurse was nowhere around. I finally found another medic who gave me his story. He told me Murphy died by drowning on his own fluids. There was nothing more they could do to stop it. That booby-trapped grenade had torn his lungs to pieces. He was our first man killed, Toby, I said. He was a good American soldier. Hell, Dick, he was a good man. My body shuddered with a deep sigh. He was a man who broke your heart, I said. Shit. Thirty years after the fact, the three of us shook our heads and stared numbly at the bustle of Quinyan's suburbs at afternoon quitting time. Ah, Johnny, I hardly knew you, a chorus from an Irish folk song. This next one is, a, uh, is an episode that took place in, in uh, Phoenix City, Alabama, May 2009 at one of our reunions. And uh, one of the people who came to that reunion for the first time was our old motor sergeant, B Company's motor sergeant. Around 2200, the waiter announces he needs to close the hospitality suite. Several men grab the ice chests, and in minutes, 20 or more old soldiers file through the austere lobby en route to the gazebo out back by the swimming pool. We reactivate our command post, and in no time, the Phoenix City, Alabama night air throbs with conversation and reeks of cheap cigar smoke. Reliving our time together in another steamy part of the world, our band of brothers shifts often, separating into groups that form and dissolve and renew continuously. Men circulate from one huddle to the next, eavesdropping until they find a story they want to enhance a bit, or a story they just haven't heard in a while. Those who've been to several reunions fall easily into conversation, and because each one remembers how intimidating the first one felt, we warmly welcome the first-timers. The noise level ebbs and flows, but never dies out. Some groups generate bursts of laughter, or at a funny anecdote, or hoots as one man joshes another. In more subdued cohorts, the storyteller may falter as memory takes him to one of those sites each of us harbors, the deep and sad places we've kept under the rug. When he gets there, his eyes tear up and his throat constricts, choking off all words. Usually a nearby buddy will finish the account, getting out at least some version of the painful story the man has yearned to tell for over four decades now. Sitting with a couple of guys from B Company, I've just hummed, I've just bummed yet another cigar from Permanent Thurman Pike, and I'm using his lighter to fire it up when from behind my back on the fringe, a loud voice booms through most conversations. I ever tell you fellows the time the captain tried to drown me? Oh shit, I don't have to look. It's Richard Wilson. This may be his first reunion, but he's anything but shy. I hear mutterings of disbelief and then a hush. After all, it isn't every day you get to hear an NCO calling out an officer. No, really look, he insists. The captain says, Sergeant Wilson, get your ass down there and hook this cable up to the tow pedal. His salvo draws sympathetic murmurs from the crowd. There's no doubt about just which captain he's talking about. I know I'm in trouble if I don't regain the initiative. Quickly, I shift to face around, to, I shift around to face him and I shout, hey, wait a minute. Hell yes, he presses on and him, pointing disdainfully my way, he asserts, used to be captain of the West Point swim team. Oh man, Wilson is warming up now, creative and plenty loose with the facts, and it seems to be working as many are getting into his story. He holds out his palm waist high and righteous indignation drips from every word as he bellows. Hell, we had 13 ton of armored personnel carrier sunk in water so deep you couldn't see more than the top three feet of the antenna. I dived down in there, water all muddy, couldn't even see the fucking APC, much less find the tow pedal. When I come up, coughing, gasping for air, 
he sends me right back down again. Taking a long pull on my can of tepid Budweiser, I think fast. It's clear I'm playing catch up now, and I shout at him, God damn it, Sergeant Wilson, what was your job? Cocking his head to one side, he scans the smiling faces to be sure everyone shares his amazement that anyone could ask such an inane question. Captain, you know I was the motor sergeant. Motor sergeant, I snap. Let's see now. Supposed to keep the vehicles running, right? He shrugs, raises both hands shoulder high and nods. And was that APC running? Running? Hell no, it wasn't running, Captain. We already know it was in 15 foot of water. Shit, how could it run? Okay, now, and what was my job? Well, you were company commander, supposed to take care of me. And that's what I'm talking about. Me not knowing how to swim, you were trying to drown me. Okay, vehicle wouldn't run. So commander commands the motor sergeant to get the stalled vehicle running. And first you had to get out of the water, right? Yeah, but Captain, I told you, he stammered, still playing to the crowd. Okay, now, tell him who it was that finally got the cable hooked up to the tow panel. Well, you did, Captain, but only after you tried to drown me. He pauses to savor the laughter, but then jumps to a fresh line of attack. Captain, you know, you better treat me right. I've got the goods on you. Wilson, goddammit, what are you talking about now? I've got evidence. Even before that time you tried to drown me, you tried to destroy my morals. I have documentary proof. Oh, come on. I have in my possession the official pass, whereas you authorized Staff Sergeant Richard Wilson to go to Sin City and on K Vietnam. It's signed 27 September 1967 by Richard P. Guthrie, Captain Infantry Commanding. Howls of laughter and hoots reverberate from the two-story facade of the courtyard. Nose in the air, lips pursed, he pans the crowd triumphantly, nodding vigorously. Wilson, I shout, still trying for the advantage. Damn it, we're finally getting somewhere. You should have been back at the motor pool taking care of the vehicles, and now you admit you confess in front of witnesses that you were off in the ville chasing the honeys. The crowd hoots and roars. Careful now, Captain, careful, I'm telling you, I'm letting everyone know. He raises from his lawn chair to strike a pose, hand on hip, finger wagging at me. I'm warning you, Captain, that pass you signed is going up on the world wide web. I jump to my feet and our faces distort with mirth as the two of us thread our way through the crowd to come together in a bear hug that lasts. Welcome home, you crazy bastard, I say softly. I'm glad you finally made it to one of these. Yeah, he murmurs. It's good to be home, Captain. You know I'd follow you all the way to East Hell. Welcome home. Okay. Uh, it's just, let me think. Yeah, there's just one more. So this is about, uh, in our 98 return trip, this is a visit to the worst battle, the, the, the uh, location, the site of the worst battle we were in, which happened on the 10th of December, 1967. We lost uh, uh, nine soldiers killed that day, which is an awful lot for a company. <coughs> so if we lost nine killed, we had, uh, we had about 30 evacuated, medevaced, and, and most of those were serious enough that they didn't rejoin the company. So we, we, we went to this location. We had a hard time finding the exact, the exact battlefield. And we piled out and, and started walking because the roads don't go everywhere. And while we were walking, a well-dressed guy, most of the, uh, we always would attract a crowd of civilians. And it would be, typically it would be uh, all ages of women and little kids. The men would all be, but they would be out working the fields. Um, and the, the kids are gorgeous. They're fun, beautiful kids. The little ones wear a t-shirt only. All the little ones. So there's no diapers or any of that. They just toddle along. It's all sandy soil. It's near the, uh, near the beach. So we started looking, and, and this guy rode up on a bicycle. He was well-dressed. He had a plaid shirt on and a snap brim straw hat. Everybody else had a conical. Had, they all had black pajamas and a conical hat on. That's what they wear. Um, and and this, this guy immediately grabbed our guide and started telling him, telling him he was somebody important. And what he was was a, uh, 
he had been a major in the Viet, he would just retired as a major in the local Viet Cong force. And so he knew his way around. He was going to take us to our battlefield. Well, he took us several places and we walked about five miles. We were worn out. Brian Thomas was wounded, so he, he actually limped, has a very pronounced limp. We were all, Toby Milroy was a meat cutter before he became an army medic. And, and uh, then he, when he got out of the army, he, be, he kept on being a meat cutter. And he's, he bulked right out. He's in Seymour, Indiana, but he's a very big man. So, so just slogging around on sandy trails in the sun was hard on us. And so we've been to all these places, and I keep explaining to the major what exactly what went on. We had armored personnel carriers and all the details I could think of. Of course, when I told him the year 1967 over and over again, uh, it meant nothing to him because they're on a lunar calendar, and it was the year of the rat or whatever year it was then. So anyway, we had we had a hard time finding it. But finally, he said he was sure he was taking us to the right place. I wasn't convinced. Ahead of us on the higher ground, I now could see thick hedges separating small fields planted in tapioca. Something seemed to fall into place to look almost familiar. We climbed up from the paddy into new shade. I paused to mop the sweat from my face and clean my sunglasses so I could check the map and compass again. Still dazzled by the white yellow balls the sun's glare had set dancing in front of my eyes, I gave up on checking the map. Somehow I felt more than I knew that we were nearing our destination. We pressed on 100 yards and there was no doubting it. We had arrived. Conversation among us ceased and we walked on to where 30 years before those withering fires had ravaged Brian's first platoon. He had been hounded ever since by the thought that if only he'd attacked that day, things might have turned out differently. Slowly we walked along the ditch. Brian peered into it and at the five foot berm along its far side, he nodded and then shook his head, resigned. I felt he was silently acknowledging what I'd tried to tell him back in Virginia. Attacking through that ditch, I had insisted, would have been impossible. Our armored personnel carriers would have bellied up, gotten stuck. This would have put them at angles that invited the rocket-propelled grenades from point-blank range. God, look how badly we were exposed here, like sitting ducks, Brian said in a hushed voice. So well concealed, split second is all you ever saw any of them, Toby said, swiping at the sweat on his brow as he caught up with us. Jesus, I said, can you imagine if our guys hadn't kept the guns firing? None of us would be here today. We each plunged into our own nightmare from that place, replaying yet again our individual films of that terrible bygone Sunday. Even our local spectators seemed to sense how deeply we were affected, and they withdrew a few steps. For a polite minute, their loud conversation subsided. As if by common accord, the three of us separated. Brian went to kneel on flat, sandy ground in the shade of a large palm. He was 10 or 15 yards from the berm that hid the sharpshooters who had us in their sights that day. Then, just as I had done three decades before, I came up alongside Brian and dropped to a knee next to him. He looked at me. This tree could be the one I was behind when I got shot, he said. I scanned the trunk for scars. This one was smooth, healthy. Brian, I don't think your tree could have survived. That one was just riddled, 50 cal rounds, looked like a sieve. I remember wondering on the next day how it could still be standing. But this has to be the right spot. Toby walked slowly back in the direction of his medevac landing pad. Some of the men had been brought to him pale and dazed or comatose. Others came in moaning, crying. Some screamed out for morphine, even long after he'd used up his last surrette. I saw him again rushing frantically from one broken, bleeding trooper to the next, desperate to stabilize each one, before rushing him onto the impatient helicopter. In that bucolic, now peaceful setting, I walked to where I figured B Company's left flank had been. Then coming back to the center, I leaned against the tree to stare at the ditch and the berm beyond. All the walking in that heat left me dehydrated. I felt lightheaded. My mind reran yet again the continuous loop movies of that terrible day. Suddenly the berm spewed its torrents of fire. I shuddered with the impotent rage, the helplessness of the jammed radio net. I heard the rock slide roar of the shooting and saw again the young lives full of promise that were snuffed out that day. 
I heard the anguished screams and saw as well the strong young men left maimed forever. Some of the wounded fixed me with a stare that begged for an explanation. The eyes of others demanded one. For three decades, these jumbled scenes had tormented me, replaying over and over, often when I least expected it. Now my throat was too tight to swallow. Tears mingled with the sweat streaming down my face. Suddenly, I felt I was in the company of the ten young, brave spirits snuffed out at that place. Uh, parentheses here, a, a tenth one was killed the, the uh, 11th of December. I saw men frozen in time, some in their steel helmets, load-bearing gear and ragged, sweat-muddy fatigues hustled around looking out for their buddies and for me. Lively and nimble, they fired their weapons, dove for cover, took care of business. Then the replay brought up others, stiff, pale, and waxen, without weapon or helmet as they'd been when we gingerly picked them up next morning. I wasn't able to speak, but with a silent prayer, I begged them all to forgive me for having led them there, for having allowed this to happen so long ago. In the mottled shade through the hum of insects and the rustle of palm fronds stirring in the shore breezes, I sensed from the other side a response. A chorus of souls answered me. They thanked the three of us for coming to that place to pay them homage. The communion among us still feels as real as any conversation I've had in my lifetime. Keeping a promise they'd made, Toby and Brian filled a number of 35 millimeter film canisters with dirt. Later, they would mail them to buddies who, along with us, had survived that terrible fight. Once soaked with the blood of too many of our comrades, this sandy soil was now a sacred relic. Gathering it for the others seemed to bring us consolation. For a few more minutes, we poked aimlessly around. Finally, numb and exhausted by the unrelenting nightmares, we nodded to each other, wordlessly agreeing we'd seen enough. To thank him for his help, we invited the Major to join us for a beer. He accepted cheerfully, and we headed for the van parked not far away. With our help, he secured his bicycle to the roof rack, and within minutes, we'd driven half a mile to what passes for a pub in that part of the world. About the size of a one-car garage, the establishment's roof was thatched with palm fronds, and the thin walls were of woven reeds. Our little group headed for a simple awning adjacent to the main building. Four poles held up a thatch roof, and under its welcome shade, we settled on a scattering of lawn chairs and a wooden bench around a low table. Over a frosty ba 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 beer, the Major used noise translating to share more of his story. Only a month or so before, not far from where we sat, he had at last found the remnants of a childhood pal. He had spent a quarter century searching, scratching, and digging for those bones. At long last, he said, he'd seen to it that his friend got a soldier's burial at one of the national cemeteries that now punctuate the countryside all over Benden province. Noy, I said, tell him we came here to remember our friends, and we understand about his lost buddy. Say I'm happy after so many years he was able to give him the burial he deserved. Say I hope his brother's soul is resting peacefully. I raised my can of beer and faced the Major. After he heard the translation, the Major nodded and took a long hit from his beer. Wincing, he wiped his mouth with the back of his hand and fired a response to Mr. Noy. After a pause, the guide stammered tentatively as if fearful the message might offend us. He say, maybe send young people to fight, to die is not good system. Tell him, I said, cutting Noy off, I think he's right. Toby stood and raised his beer. We don't have many years left, the old medic said, but let's do what we can to help keep peace everywhere. As Noy translated into Vietnamese, I stood as well and raised my beer again. Brian got up. The major also rose and raised his can. Somberly, he looked us in the eye and gave us a formal nod. One after another, we returned the nod, wordlessly making a solemn pledge. To seal our vow, the four of us stood at attention and drank together an old warrior's toast. Thank you. Thank you.
So I'll just wrap this up. Uh, I've, I've uh, been writing this thing now for 17 years, and, and uh, along the way I also occasionally ventured into poetry. Uh, this one's called uh, Sticks and Stones. Uh, I want to read first, though, a quote from the Monterey, 22 May 2002, Monterey County Herald. Seaside, Daniel Aguirre, the obituaries. Daniel Ernest Aguirre, also known as Danny Two Dog, died of a stroke Saturday in Seaside. He was born November 17, 1944, and had lived in Seaside for many years. He was a disabled Vietnam War veteran, serving in the Army from 1967 to 69 and from 74 to 77. He received several Vietnam Service Medals. He'll be missed by numerous friends and providers of services to the homeless. Mr. Aguirre is survived by his sister, Elizabeth Giles of Oregon. Memorial services will be held at 10 a.m. today at the Salvation Army Good Samaritan Center in Sand City. Struven Laporte will handle the arrangements. Memorial contributions can be made to the Good Samaritan Center, Sand City, which can be reached at 899-4988. Sticks and stones. You called America, we came from hometowns all across this great nation. Reluctant but too imbued we were with dad's sense of duty to country to join those less inclined hunkered up north to wait it all out. The year of service to country left us numb, stripped, vulnerable, each desperate to set free the private demons raging inside. A stampede too frightful for words even to paint, much less exercise. We needed most of all to mourn, to grieve, lost youth, lost innocence, dashed ideals, and to lament our brethren stilled or maimed by those purported cunning enemies of the democratic way. And we'd yet to sing the bravery of your heroes, America. And it was the slamming door of the special welcome from the very countrymen we'd been sent off to defend left us scarred more deeply yet than any foreigner's steel and powder ever could. And it's the stillbirth of our grieving to this day impels us more welcome shocked, wounded, to drift aimlessly under bridges in the alleys or the parking lot of your neighborhood strip mall. As yet we grope for the paddock gate's key still powerless to lose the 24-7 ever raging demons. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dick, for sharing uh, your experience with us. Um, we look forward to the book being published. Have you thought of a title for it yet? Gone to Soldiers, Everyone is the, okay. is the uh, working title. Okay. I think I'll stay with that. Right, That's so. a chorus from a, I don't yet have Pete Seeger's permission to use that. Okay, we look forward of to it. Of course, that. it'll be hard to come by, but okay. I'll. Thank you so <laughs> I'll, much for coming today. Well, thanks very much you. for your interest, and, and please keep this worthwhile project going. We will. Thank you.